we're in the functions unit right now. Um, and some of you are still actually in lists and strings doing the adventure game. Hopefully we'll get those done quickly. Um, but what we're gonna do today is we're gonna look at uh, uh, chapter 10, which is just one, one activity, that's all it is, called Prisoner's Dilemma. And so it's something we're gonna kind of do together, um, but we're gonna kind of go through a little explanation of this thing first. So uh, Prisoner's Dilemma or Iterative Prisoner's Dilemma is, uh, is um, game theory, okay? Now game theory sounds like really fun stuff like games and stuff. But really what we mean by game theory is like, uh, you know, people that are good at game theory, they work for like the Pentagon, okay? They uh, might, you know, you, you figure out like on, you know, a massive scale, how people might react to something else. And uh, it's like social science is kind of like game theory where you're trying to figure, predict how things might happen. Like if there's gonna be an uprising over here, you might be able to predict Kind of social behavior and things like this. So, um, um, game uh, prisoner's dilemma is a classic um, uh, fundamental kind of thing in game theory. And there's a kind of a scenario that we're going to go through on what happens, and you have to make a decision on whether you want to betray or collude with some partner in crime. And we and we try to figure out, you know, what's what's the best possibilities and everything. And, and so a lot of this game theory and predicting what's gonna happen in the world and things, it comes down to computer science. It's simulations. You're running simulations on all kinds of things and possibilities. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm just gonna do some public reading here. I was gonna have different people read different parts of this stuff, but I'm just gonna do some reading for you. If you wanna follow along, I'm on this page. So how do individuals make strategic decisions what has a greater impact on making a decision, the prospect of reward or the threat of punishment? How do decisions made in one situation apply to another? As we learned about version control, which that, that's kind of what we were supposed to be doing at this, but you already kind of know how to do this stuff. So, and collaboration solutions. We'll explore and modify existing code that simulates a round robin, here comes Jake, a round robin tournament among many players. So we're, we're gonna do all this all together today. You're gonna to code your own little section and we're gonna, we're gonna run the whole program and we're gonna compete against each other. See how, see how well we do. So it's important to kind of understand what's happening here. The game that we're gonna be using is called the Iterative Prisoner's Dilemma, IPD, a fundamental problem in game theory. Game theory is an approach to studying the social sciences using computation to understand and predict people's behavior Game theory is used, for example, to understand and predict economic phenomena like stock market fluctuations and political phenomena like revolutions. Nations use game theorists to advise national leaders and negotiators in order to help them understand the group's dynamics and predict results for various actions they are considering taking. Game theorists use algorithms to describe people's decisions. So computer science, you know, one aspect you can go and make a ton of money, by the way would be to go into this kind of uh, thing, game theory and try to predict various things in the world. If the cafeteria director decides to raise the lunch price above a certain point, you will opt not to buy school lunch, right? Million dollars for school lunch, you're out, right? I mean, there's, there's some level for you. I don't know what it is, but there's some level for you. And then uh, on, a, on a large group of people, then there's, there's a, a pretty predictable probably level, you know, of just, normal average people, there'd be some kind of level. And so you would write algorithms to predict exactly, you know, how high can they raise the lunch price before they're going to start losing because no one's going to be buying the lunch. And, and so a lot of these things are, uh, you know, a lot of this comes down to money. You know, it, usually everything comes down to money. Okay. Um, at what price? Are there other factors? A game theorist could write an algorithm for the decision to buy school lunch in terms of price and other factors. The iterative prisoner's dilemma is a series of rounds of the prisoner's dilemma. The prisoner's dilemma was one of the early algorithmic problems in game theory, first posed in 1950. In the prisoner's dilemma, you and a partner have committed a crime together and you are caught without evidence. The police question you and your partner separately. And here's the results on what happens. 
if both of you collude together, which basically both of you refuse to talk or rat out the other one, okay? Then that's good. I mean, well, it's not good. I mean, this is the bad scenario. Sorry about the ethics of this. But basically, if you collude together and refuse to talk to the police, you both will go free, okay? And of course, you, you know, there's a reward for that because you stole this, <laughs> you stole it, stole the money or whatever. So you go free and you get the money, okay? If you both confess your crime and betray each other and say, yes, they did it, you're going to betray, then the liability of the crime will be split between you and you both will receive the standard punishment. So if you both betray each other, um, you know, you're going to jail, you're going to lose the money that you had, you're both going to receive some punishment, but it's, it's not actually as bad as what possibly could happen. If you stonewall the police, hoping to collude with your partner, but your partner in the meantime betrays you. So you collude, you say, I'm not giving up my partner, but your partner gives you up, okay? You will receive an unusually severe punishment while they go free and keep, to keep all the money. So the worst possible scenario that could happen is uh, you collude with them and they betray you, all right? Okay. If you betray your partner while they attempt to collude with you, you will receive the cash and the freedom. That's the best thing that could happen is actually if you betray them, but they actually collude with you, okay? So uh, you might, I don't know, those are the scenarios. And generally when I tell people about this game and I show them, everybody seems to think it's easy. Like it's, well, I'll just, you know, I'll just betray him while they collude with me. But you, you got to know, you don't know what are they going to do? Are they going to collude with you or, or what's going to happen? Okay. So this game that we're going to be playing is in Python and it's going to run and you're going to write an algorithm for what is how you're going to decide every single time. Okay. Now you don't actually decide every time you write an algorithm based on um, your history of what you've done and what the person that you're going against at that particular time, what they've done. Because you're, you're not gonna just do it one time. It's gonna, if it's, it's computer science. So it's gonna run things in a loop, you know, a lot of times. And it's gonna say, you're gonna go up against like, so um, Aaron's gonna go against Bryce somewhere in this run. When we do the run, everybody's algorithms are gonna be there, all 17 of you. And it's gonna go through a really fast, it's gonna do super fast. It's gonna put you versus you like, a hundred times, somewhere from a hundred to 200 times, it's going to have your algorithms go against each other. Okay. And then it's going to give an overall score. Okay. Between you two. And then it's going to have you run against uh, Ethan, like a hundred and up to 200 times run real fast. And it's going to give you each a score for that. Okay. So you're going to run against every other person in the class. Okay. Like a hundred to 200 times. And you can, you're going to be able to see, it's going to print out a text document of being able to see you know, you betrayed and then they colluded and you betrayed and then they colluded and so on. Okay. And then eventually you're going to have an average score for the whole class, how you did against every single person. Okay. So it doesn't matter that you beat one person. Like if they collude every single time and you betray them every single time, you're going to annihilate them. Right. But the problem is that algorithm might not hold up with some other people and you're trying to win the whole class. So on the average, you're gonna to have to have, you're gonna to try to be the high score, okay? So it, it doesn't always just, you might think, well, I'm just gonna betray, you know. People build algorithms to say, hey, they colluded with me twice, I'm gonna collude with them, okay? Or something like that. And, then, and you can actually score higher, not just by betraying every single time. Okay, so it's, it's, it seems kind of easy sometimes. It's not. It's kind of complicated. So here's the point results. So this is your action, and here's your partner's action. If you collude and they collude, there is, there's no points. Okay, and you might think, well, that's not very good. But the, the thing is, when we run this game, like all of you are going to have like negative points. I mean, it, like that's how it always works out. You're just, the winner will be whoever has the least amount of negative points. So really, you know, zero is a whole bunch better than both of these two things happening. Does that make sense? So you look at zero and I, I know students look at zero and they think that's a terrible score. That's a zero. That is an amazing score compared to this and this. Do you understand? So there's, there's real value in colluding with someone that's also colluding with you. Because on the average, 
I would take a zero a lot because I mean, no one's going to have a score of even zero. Zero would be an amazing high score probably. Okay. So if you betray them and they collude with you though, you do go, you do get a plus 100 points. It's the only scenario where you get a positive amount of points. Okay. So this is the best scenario really for you. Okay. But this is second best. So this is good. This is a really good one. You should try to be, get this. Okay. If you betray them and they betray you, then it's a negative 250. If you collude with them and you betray them and they betray you, you get negative 500 points. Okay. So that's the one you're trying to avoid, which is why people are afraid to collude. Because if you collude and they betray, you lost a lot. So it's, you know, it's kind of a tricky thing. All right. In the iterative prisoner's dilemma, many rounds are played one after another with the same partner in crime. So like, as it goes through once time, you know, it'll be like 100 to 250 rounds of you going against your partner in crime. Betraying in one round will sometimes cause the partner to lose trust and be less likely to collude with you in future rounds. Once partners start betraying each other, round after round, they end up turning each other in and doing poorly. Considering, considered together, you and your partner's outcomes are better if you collude round after round. That, that, that's, that's true. They are better if you can collude with your partner, okay? Because you're gonna go against all the other partners in your class later, right, in the same game. So if you collude with your partner every time, you guys can you know, not have a whole bunch of negative points, okay? And then you know, if they don't collude with somebody else, then that, you, you know, that's gonna be good, okay. Uh, yeah. The prisoner's dilemma lets social scientists study the conditions under which people will act either selfishly or in the best collective interest of the group. Our, which, you know, it's, you know, that's kind of a sad thing there because it, it, it technically, it's kind of like talking about, you know, capitalism versus socialism, you know, and your arguments on whether which one is good and which one's bad, you know, I mean, Generally, you know, it's like, you know, trying to improve yourself, you know, it's kind of capitalism. Socialism is like, are we going to always be looking out for every single, everybody else? Well, when you do that, sometimes people take advantage of you, right? So, I mean, it's, there's, there's arguments for both of these, you know, kinds of things, you know, there's kind of an argument for it actually, you know, a kind of a merged thing with that. All right. So we have capitalism, but we also have social security. So there, you know, there, we have different parts of both of these things in our, even in our government. So I'll let you all debate that as you get older. Okay. Um, our recent capacity to generate, collect, store, and analyze huge amounts of data quickly has caused dramatic changes in all career fields. Simulation was an unimportant tool in social sciences in 1960. The rise in computational power has changed the, changed the career fields in social sciences such that simulation is now a fundamental and common tool for many social scientists. I mean, even for like weather prediction, I mean, there's all kinds of things now that algorithms and possibilities and simulations are, um, are amazing. Your teacher has assigned you to a team. I've actually, we, we used to do this in partners. I actually, today, you're on your own. You're on, you have your own team. And I put your actually names into the program, which we're going to uh, fork and clone here in a little bit. Okay, so we're going to explore the simulation. Um, I think what we'll do is... Well, I'm gonna go ahead and read down this through this and we'll, and we'll do it. So we're gonna fork and clone and you can create a testing. If you wanna do the testing branches on your, on your forked copy or your cloned copy, you can do that. Otherwise you just, you know, if you remember how to do the testing stuff, you can do that. Um, you're gonna run the file. You're gonna enter the number of teams you want to run in the simulation. Um, try just four for the first run. Data from the simulation are printed to the screen and stored in a data file also. On screen, you should see the following information. So if I, the, I, if I run that program that you're gonna download here in a little bit, it's gonna say, I, cause I added some to the program. I've tweaked the program a little bit over the years. And it says, you know, how many teams do you wanna run against each other? Okay, so eventually we'll be writing it. We'll say like, you know, 17, cause I think there's 17 students. So we'll actually say 20, cause those first three teams are uh, sample teams. So you run it and it runs it, you know, it runs it for a while, it runs against everybody. And it's gonna print out to the screen uh, something like this, okay? 
And so this is important to understand this because it's kind of confusing. It says each column shows the score earned per round against each other player. So if I'm, if I'm uh, player three, I'm actually looking at this column to see how I did against everybody else. So, so right, right here, player three against player zero, um, zero. We scored a zero, we kind of broke even, right? But player three against player one, um, negative 375, okay? I got zero against player two, I got zero against player three. Of course, I got zero against player three because that's me. So it didn't really run against me against myself, right? So there's always going to be a zero when you're, you know, when it, the row and the column matches. And then the total overall, I got a negative 375. Okay. Player zero, negative 500. Okay. All right. And this says average per round. Okay. Average per round with the team strategy names. So it's going to print out overall all the way. So we played everybody else. And so if I average, like, like here's a round I played against zero, and here's a round I played against one. And I could take these totals and I could average them, you know, with the amount of rounds we played. And that's going to be my overall score. Okay. So if you look down here, player zero was a negative 125. Okay. Player one was a negative 12.19. Negative 93.97, negative 93.75. to So in this, this one, player one, who's named Backstabber, okay? They're named Backstabber because they just betray every single time. Okay? They actually won in this one. And if you have a low amount of teams, not a lot of people playing, Backstabber tends to do pretty good. But this is social sciences. So if you get a huge group of people that all have these different algorithms, Backstabber usually loses after that point, okay? Okay, so are you making sense so far? Kind of how this is working? There, there's a lot more to show you. So each column shows the score earned per round against each player. Looking at the second table, which player finished with the highest average score? That's who the winner is. Notice they were all negatives, right? They're all negatives though, anyway. The simulation program represents each decision by one of two characters, a C or a B. Okay, so you're going to have a little section of code in this program where you're going to write your algorithm. And at the end of your algorithm, you need to return C or you need to return B. These are text strings, okay? You're returning the letter C or you're returning the letter B. Every time your algorithm needs to spit out, I'm going to return a collude. I'm going to collude or I'm going to betray. That's what the C and the B stand for. So every time you run your algorithm based on some stuff, which I'll show you in a minute, and then you have to either return a C or return a B. That's, that part's pretty simple. Those are the only two options you can do. You know, some people, you know, I don't know, I don't want to mention names, Jake Perman, uh, will probably try to break the system or hack the system or something like that, okay? That's not the point of this activity, okay? And I'm not, I'm not totally trashing Jake because that's what I tried to do when I was at a teacher meeting and we were introduced to this thing. I tried to hack it and just say, if it's team four, just always, you know, do this or whatever. I tried to actually hack the opponent's history. And you're not supposed to do that. I got in trouble and, you know, didn't play well. So I lose automatically. So the idea is to try to understand the game theory. So, you know, try to come up with a cool algorithm that actually makes you win, like legitimately win, okay? So you're gonna only stay in your code. You're not gonna change the code of the program. You can do those things later if you want because you're gonna have a copy of the program. So you can do those things later for some other time if you want to. Okay, so you're gonna return a C or a B to collude or betray, okay? Before making the decision each round, each player or algorithm can consider what has happened in previous rounds. The algorithms have the previous rounds information in the form of a string, okay? For example, CCB, that's it's just a string, a length of string of characters, CCB, indicates that the player colluded in the first two rounds and betrayed in the most recent round. The last round they, they betrayed. Each player can consider two strings, one for their own history and one for their crime partner's history. In the below example, five rounds have been played. 
considering the following two histories, you can determine each of their scores, right? So your history, you colluded every time. Last five rounds, you colluded, okay? Your crime partner's history, they colluded, they colluded, they colluded, they colluded, and then they betrayed, okay? So my score right now, the first, after the first round, we both colluded, we got zero, right? We both got zero. Then we got zero again, zero again, zero again. But then in the last round, I colluded and they betrayed me, right? So what's their overall score now? It was 100, right? I can't, I can't even remember. And my score would be negative 500, right? I think that's how it is. So then we'll go again. Okay, and it, and it does this with, with each partner, it does it like, you know, 100 to up to 200 times. It's like a kind of random, but there's, it gives you a lot of times, okay? And then it'll eventually it'll give you an overall score of what you scored against that particular person. Does that make sense? And then it goes and it runs you against somebody else. And the, your final score is an average of all those things. So, you know, just because you do something really good against one partner doesn't mean, you know, you lose against everybody else. That's not going to be good. Okay. So you get, uh, there's two strings that you can play with, with your algorithm. You can look at the opponent's history. Like, what did they do the very last time? Then the last round, what did they do? You can look at your own history. What did I do? Because see, you're not being able to do this. You're not being able to actually play every round. See, your algorithm is playing for you. You're going to write an algorithm. It's playing for you. We're just going to hit start, and then the scores are going to be there. And it went through, went through all those things really quickly. Okay? So you need to say, okay, I'm going to, like on my first round, I don't know what's happening, so I'm just going to collude. So I return C on the first round. Okay? And the, how would you do that? Well, you know your history or the opponent's history, and you can just do a len, right? Because they're strings. You're going to get an opponent history var variable. It's a, it's a string. And you can just do what's the len, length of the opponent history. And if it's, if it's you know, zero, or if it's, or it's like one, then we know it was the first round, right? And so we can see, okay, it's first round, so I'm just going to collude. Return C. Elif, you know, length is greater than one, then and, you know, what do they do? So get the splice the string and figure out what character they used, okay? And if they used a B, well, I'm betraying them now. So return B, right? Or if they return C, I'm gonna return C, okay? You can, based on what the opponent's history is, you can decide what you're gonna do on that round or your algorithm will decide what you're gonna do. Does that make sense? No, it's kind of complicated. I'll show you some examples here in a little bit so we'll know how to do it. So, um, Okay, so the four players in the first simulation you ran use three different algorithms as labeled in the second table, loyal, backstabber, loyal, vengeful. Okay, so here I have some, and, I, and I've kept these in the program, okay? So the first uh, player here is called Team Zero. It's called Loyal. This example player collude, always colludes. So it's a very small algorithm. It's not impressive at all. Okay, it says if player equals zero, so you don't change that. That's not what you would change. It says, if getting team name, you don't change that because it's going to try to get your team name. Um, return uh, loyal, that's the team name. So you don't do anything in there. Then there's an else. And there's going to be an else, colon. And then after, in this else section is where you're writing your algorithm. Okay? So the only thing this player did is return C. That's all they did. Okay, these are like parts of functions. That's why we're doing it now because we're talking about function. So they return C, which uh, their algorithm says, I'm gonna collude every single time. With anybody I play, I'm gonna collude every single time. So that this, this team name is called loyal. Okay, look at the next player. Player one, his, his name is backstabber. Okay, um, he did hardly anything at all also. In the else section is where the only place you can put your code. He returned B every time. He betrays every single time. That's why it's called backstabber. Okay, so that's all his algorithm is. Your algorithms need to be more complicated than that. Don't just return C or return B. Okay, so you're going to have to look at the opponent history and just make a decision, something based on something. Okay, you can even do it randomly because I have import random up at the top of this program. 
Okay, so you can even do something randomly, like, you know, do a random thing and, uh, you know, betray, okay? Or you could look at their past history and see how, what percent of the time have they been betraying you? You know, you could do something like that. You can write an algorithm and check the string and see how, you know, what is, how many times is, does B come up and what's the length of the string and get a percentage. And there's a lot of different things you could do. The final team here is a little more complicated. I wanted to show you an example of something a little more complicated. This team is called Loyal Vengeful. This example player is silent at first and then only betrays if they were a sucker on the last round. So this team is called Loyal Vengeful. Here's the else. So in the else section is where their program is. So there's their whole program right there. Okay. So what do they do in their program? They say if len of the opponent history. So this is, this is a variable you get. Everybody see that? You get that variable. You might want to write it down. That, that's the variable you get. That's the opponent history. It's a string of B's and C's that your opponent that you're playing right now has been doing. Okay. It says if len opponent history equals equals zero, that means what? It means it's the first round. So because see, you're not doing this, the program is doing it. So the first round, it goes through and there's nothing in the opponent history string right now. Okay, which means that it's the first round right now. Okay. So what do they do? Return C. So they collude on the first round every time they play any of you. They're going to return C. Okay. Elif, right, which means it's not the first round. Elif, history. Okay. So there's the, uh, that's the other variable you get. That's your history. That's your history. So you got opponent, opponent underscore history, or you got just history. History is yours. Opponent history is the other ones. Those are the only two variables you get to play with. That's the only thing you can check. You can check anything about the opponent history and check anything about your own history. Now they're strings, so they're kind of like lists, right? So what does this do right here? It says L if history bracket, square bracket, minus one equals equals C. What's that checking? What's that checking? If I have a string and I, and I try to pick minus one, character, what's that looking at? That's looking at the last character that just happened, right? Now, that I would get an error of my program if I tried to do this right at the beginning, because in the first, in the very first round, there is nothing there, right? So you'd actually get an error. So you got to make sure that you don't have errors in your program. I, I'm going to, you're going to pull request this to me, I'm going to actually pull it in. See, we're, that's how it's going to work. You're going to fork and clone this in here in a little bit. You're going to try to work on your algorithm overnight. And then you're going to pull request it. And I'm going to try to pull it back in and with the actual file. So tomorrow, I'll run the one file. Everybody's program will be in there and we'll see who wins. OK, now I'm going to try to look at your code and make sure that it's not I'm not pulling in something that's going to break everything. So you want to do run test on your own code before you uh, send, send it in there. Okay, so I'm checking, I'm checking what was the last character that I just did previously. And if I colluded on the last round and opponent history minus one, they betrayed me. So on the last round, I colluded and they betrayed. Okay, that ticks me off. Okay, so what am I gonna do? I'm gonna return B. Okay, I'm gonna return B. Else, remember you have to have one last option. Else, I'm going to return C. So if if I didn't collude and betray, then I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to still collude. So for instance, if I um, like if I actually betrayed them, and they also betrayed me, okay, then I'm actually going to collude this next time, right? But if the situation where I colluded with them and they betrayed me, okay, that's unacceptable. I'm going to betray in this round. All right. Does that make sense? But if we both betrayed each other, hey, you know, I betrayed you too, so I'm going to give you a pass. And I'm going to collude with you this next time. Okay. Or if I if I betrayed them and they colluded, okay, then I'm I'm going to collude again. Does that make sense? So this section is kind of, this is where you only can put your code. 
And you got to make sure, here's what we've had problems in the past. You got to make sure that all the possibilities are taken care of. So if something return, L if something else return, then you need to have an else and to, to do something. Okay. So you can't just have, a lot of people have a whole bunch of L ifs. And then there's something that's not actually one of those situations. So it doesn't know what to do. And it doesn't return anything at all. That won't break the program. But if you look at the text file and you look at your player versus like some other player, you should have in the text file, you should have a whole strings of Bs and Cs. And it should be the same length. So there's where we have some problems every once in a while. Someone does some, writes some bad code and does and forgets to return something on a round. And that actually kind of it makes you kind of win. But then I go into the code and I see that your string of Bs and Cs aren't as long as this other string. So someone has bad code. You should have the same length of strings. Okay, you need to make sure that you've returned something every time. So here's a 10 round match between player zero and player one. Results as follows. So they colluded every time, they betrayed every time. They got a score of plus thousand, they got a score of minus 5,000. Okay, so it kind of looks bad like colluding, but it's only bad if they're gonna betray you every time. Analyze the code for these algorithms and record the results you expect from a 10 round match of the IPD between player one and player two, following the previous example, matching player zero to player one. Okay, um, then there's gonna be a text file that gets generated every time and you can open it up and it's gonna show you all the strings, Bs and Cs for every player against every other player. Okay, so you can open up that text file and see what it looks like. Okay, all right. So you're gonna develop your own algorithm. You're gonna contribute your strategy to the class collaboration. You're gonna pull request once you think you got it ready to go. You're gonna pull request it and uh, I'll try to merge it in and we'll see if we can get this to work. Sometimes it's a big failure. Sometimes it works, we'll see. So you need to go to chapter 10 right now. Click on the Fort Clone chapter 10 prisoner dilemma because we're all doing this thing together. We're gonna to finish this unit and tomorrow. So you're going to get it right here. I'm going to click uh, fork. Where should we fork this? I'm going to fork it to my account. Okay, so now it's in my account. And so now I'm going to go into PyCharm. And I'm gonna go, so this is, gonna, this is the thing I'm kind of wondering about. So we're gonna have to try to figure this out. Um, VCS, get, clone, um, version control, I want to get uh, URL. So in your URLs, um, there used to be, you've seen a prisoner's dilemma URL all year long, I think, right? There's been, there's been one in there all year long. That's because I had put you in Teams and GitHub. There's a thing you can do in GitHub. I put you in Teams and I ac actually had to sign that repository to the team. That's why you were seeing it all the time. I removed those Teams and took that out because I'm not really using it. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you, if you don't see that anymore. Yeah, it's gone. Okay, so, but now you, since you forked it to your account, you should see a prisoner's dilemma URL from your account, right? So if you notice in mine, see, I see one, I see one from CSP UHS because I own that account. So I see one from there too. So I'm going to, in fact, maybe I should probably just use that one, but I'm not going to, I'll just do another one. Okay, that's going to work. Um, attach it. Okay, so now I have a folder. Okay, and inside the folder is a readme thing. And there's a file that says prisoner's dilemma. Everybody have it? Okay, so open that up. Okay, now there's your own copy. So you're um, you're going to want to go into just, uh, you know, your place. But if you look at the top here, let's just kind of look down through this a little bit. So I know some of you, 
I can imagine, are going to kind of piece through this and look at what everything's happening here. And by now, there's a lot of stuff in here. You should be able to understand a lot of what's going on. So there's some notes here at the top about prisoner's dilemma, okay, about what stuff. I did an import random in case anybody wanted to use it. Um, and then there's a, there's a function. It's called play around, right? See that? There's a function called play around. I think there's three functions total in this whole program, maybe. And there, it takes a whole bunch of parameters. It takes player one, player two, history one, history two, and score one and score two. Okay, and then it, there's some notes here. It tells about what it does. So it calls the get action function. So this function is gonna call another function, which will get the character C or B for collude and betray for each player. The history is provided as a string. CCB indicates the player colluded to the first two rounds and betrayed the most recent round. I guess I'm supposed to have this on bigger font for you guys. Sorry. It returns a four, it returns a four tuple with updated histories and scores. History one, history two, score one, score two. You know what? That's why I couldn't hack it earlier. So I just didn't hack the, I was trying to actually, you know, what I tried to do is I tried to go to opponent history and delete the last character and put in uh, collude. I tried to always try to change that. But the thing is, I just didn't realize that to know right now it's a tuple. Remember what the, how the difference between tuples and lists? You can't modify them once they've been made, right? So that's why they did a tuple, I'm sure. So, all right. Um, then there's a whole bunch of stuff here in this function. You can kind of look at it if you want and sort of figure out what's going on. Then there's another function here called play iterative rounds. It takes two parameters, player one and play two. It says plays a random number of rounds between 100 and 200. That's why random's in there. Of the iterative prisoner's dilemma between two strategies identified in the parameters as integers, returns a four tuple but with much longer strings, okay? And so that's that function. Here's another function called get action. It takes a whole bunch of parameters. It gets the strategy for the player given their own history and that of their opponent, as well as the current scores within this pairing. The parameters history and opponent history are strings with one letter per round, blah, 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 blah. Okay, we know that stuff. And then here we go. Here's all the teams, okay? So notice here, teams, uh, zero and zero through two are example teams. I wanted to throw some example players in there. So don't touch the first three teams, team zero, team one, and team two. So team zero is, is called loyal. This player always colludes. You'll see what they're doing there. So when you run your program, you will be playing against three teams. Like when your practices, you'll be running against three teams. Okay. And uh, you know, if, if you change those, see, that's the problem. If, if you, if you change anybody else's code, like you might be tempted to like uh, change player zero to some other algorithm and try it against yours. Um, when you pull request it, I'm gonna, it's gonna be pull requesting any other changes you made. So that's gonna be a problem. So that's why it's good to maybe make a testing branch or make another copy of this for yourself somewhere you know, so you can actually play around with it. But when you pull request this thing, to, this file to me, you can only change your team, right? Because it's going to try to override everything else and it, it won't allow me to merge it in, okay? Or I won't be able to, I tell you, I can't merge this because that's going to change this other line of code that you weren't supposed to be changing, okay? So that's why it's good to, if you know how to make the branch, you know, you come down here and you make your testing branch in your branches down here somewhere. Uh, let's see, maybe I need to be, I can't remember where it is. Jake Perman will be able to tell you. He makes branches all the time. So you make a testing branch and you can play around with it and stuff. And then you merge that your, your code back into the, your regular file and then pull request that one. That'd be the way to do it. So here's team uh, one, backstabber, returns B every time. Here's team two, loyal vengeful. Okay, so it's in the else section where you're writing your code. Okay, so then each student team can change one of these LF segments of code below. So here's team three, it's Aaron, okay? So um, what I did is I left in the loyal vengeful type of code. I left this program in every single one of yours. So here's, here's uh, team four is Tom, okay? And then team five is uh, Bryce and uh, this part down here in the else section is the same for all of you right now. 
Okay. So as you go on down, you need to find your team. And the only section you're changing is, is the, L, the thing in the L section. The first line you might want to keep um, because it's a line that says if the length of the opponent history equals zero, then you know it's the first round. So you might, you might leave that line there, you know, because it's the first round. So you don't really know what you're going to do. Okay. Um, and you can decide what you want to do in the first round. So you might want to leave that line right there. And then you can do another LF, and this is checking the last thing for your history and the last thing for your opponent history. Maybe you don't care what the last thing is on your own history. So now is where you can start changing some stuff. But you need to eventually probably have an else return something. Okay? And you should have a return in every one of your if statements too, because you gotta, you gotta be returning something. All right, so I'm going to uh, run this program. And basically there's uh, collude, there's the colluding all the time, there's betraying all the time, and there's a whole bunch of you that are all doing the loyal vengeful thing. So I'm gonna run this and this is how it works. So actually I wanted to show you, I wanna go all the way to the bottom, show you what I did at the bottom. So at the bottom, I have a, uh, there's, there's another function down here after all the teams, let's see, where is it? After all the teams get put in, or is it, oh, they're in there. Let's see, yeah. So there's, there's the last person, uh, that's player 20. I don't have a player in for that. 19, player 18, player 17 is Jenny. Okay, um, so after that, there's a, uh, another function called play tournament. And it takes the number of players. Okay, and it runs this. So down at the bottom, I have def main, right? See, I added kind of this in. So there's def main and it says, how many teams equals int input? How many teams do you wanna run this tournament? And you put in 20. And then I actually, had, I added one to it, okay? So if you wanna run like, you know, through player 20, you actually have to run 21, right? Because, or whatever, to get all the other people in. So if, uh, if how many teams is greater than 21, I just had to run the play tournament function uh, with 21. Else I played tournament with that many teams. So then if name equals main, run main, okay? So when I ran this whole program, it says, how many teams do you wanna run in this tournament? Max 20. So I'm gonna put in like uh, 17. Okay, I'm gonna run 17 teams. And I hit return and it went fast. It does it really, really fast. Okay, so you get this first table, which is terrible. I mean, it's, I mean, there's no point even looking at it. It's just worthless unless you can, I don't know. I need to go change the code and make this kind of look like a nice graph or something, or this is pretty bad. So player zero, and you're trying to look at the columns about what you did against everybody, but that's why we have a text file. We'll look at that in a second. So here's where, this is a good table though. Average per round with team strategy. So we can see who won. So, um, Backstabber, Loyal got negative 27.78. Backstabber got negative 60.84. Backstabber ended up losing this entire game, okay? Loyal Vengeful was negative 20.88. That was the winner. Now, all of you had Loyal Vengeful, okay? Right, you all had Loyal Vengeful, so you all got the same score. So you all won, okay? But that's just to prove right there that you know, backstabbing every time doesn't always work. I mean, they, they actually lost here overall, right? They did really good against, you know, they did pretty good against, you know, a lot of different people, okay? But overall, they lost bad, okay? Because it's the average of all the scores, okay? And a lot of us got, you know, less negative scores against each other, okay? When we played backstab, we probably lost badly. Okay, but overall, we had a lot less scores than Backstabber got overall. Does that make sense? Okay, now what you'll notice though, is when you ran that over here in your fo folder, do you see, there's a new file. You see in that folder, it downloaded a tournament.txt file. Okay, that's in your folder on your computer, but you can open it. I think I can open it right here. Click on the tournament. Yeah, so here's what the text file looks like. Normally you'll open it up in like Word or a text document, you know, 
or just go into the folder and actually click it. It'll open it up in a, um, so anyway, I don't know if you can see this or not. I'm gonna try to zoom out a little bit, but here it says team one versus team zero. Okay, team one scored 100 points, team zero scored negative 500. Remember what team zero was? It was loyal, it colluded every time. Backstabber backstabbed every time, okay? So you got these two strings and they're exactly the same length. See, they're the same length from there to there, right? So you need, when you run your code, you need to open up that text file and you need to make sure that all the string lengths for all these teams, that they're the same length. Because if they're not, someone's not returning a C or a B, some, some, they have bad codes, okay? I'd really like it if you checked on that before you tried to pull requests, so make sure that's happening. Um, so see, this string is all Bs, this string is all Cs. And how long is the string? Well, it's, it's kind of a random number from 100 to 200. So it just runs at enough times. You'll notice in this next one here, see, it didn't run it as many times. So this is team two versus team zero, loyal, vengeful versus loyal. Okay, so loyal colluded every time, but then look at loyal, vengeful colluded every time too, right? But that's not what their algorithm really said to do. Like Loyal's algorithm said to collude every time. Loyal eventually said collude on the first time, but then check to see what they're doing, right? And if they if they pick collude, then go ahead and collude with them, right? So that's why. So this this string of C's is not because they return collude every time. It's because they I mean they they, they programmed it to do that. They programmed it to decide what this person did and make a decision on that, right? If they collude, go ahead and collude. So because they colluded every time, this person actually did collude every time, which helps because they both took a zero score there, which is awesome. I'll take a zero score any day of the week in a big group, okay? Because that means I'm not taking like a negative 500 or a negative 250 or something like that, okay? Now let's look at backstabber versus loyal vengeful, okay? So they colluded in the first try. See, they colluded. And they, but then they, on the second try, they, they looked and they say, what did the other one do, right? They backstabbed me, okay? So then I'm gonna do, uh, let's see, why did that, um, hmm, let me think here. Oh yeah, okay, that's why it would do it. So really what they should have done is they should have probably checked to see, you know, if the other one backstabbed me, then go ahead and backstab them every time or something. But, what they did is they said, did they backstab me last time and did I collude? If they did, backstab them. So the second time they backstabbed them, right? But then on the next round they said, did I collude last time and they backstabbed me? And the answer would have been no, I actually backstabbed them and they backstabbed me. So I colluded with them, well, that's gonna hurt me, okay? So loyal vengeful C got annihilated here, okay? But backstabber won. Right, so loyal vengeful got killed by backstabber, but then but then totally won the game overall, right? See how that works? So you got a text file that you can always look at. All right, that was a lot of talking. Let's have a discussion. What questions do you have about how to do this? So how do we like test it when we're doing it? So what you're going to do, so you're, you're not going to be able to test it against everybody else. Right. But like, at least against the people, like what's the function? Like if I just want to run my thing. If you want to, like you run the program, you click the little green arrow at the top. Yeah. But I don't want to run it against everyone. How do I run it against like, just. Oh, so like what? So no, this, the all, well, this is the only way you could do it. So like, if you're going to run it, you're going to run the program, okay? Mm -hmm. You need to run. Uh, you need to run down. You're going to play everybody down to your team. I see. To, to include the way I have it set up right now, anyway. Okay. I don't have it set up. I could actually change that probably to say, you know, run team one versus team two only or something. Okay. But right now, like if you're team seventeen, you got to at least run down to that team. Okay. So you're running against everybody. So, so you're gonna be basically running it against, um, you're gonna be testing your program against loyal, against backstabber and against loyal vengeful.
is what you're going to be doing. Now, that's why I was saying, if you want to make a branch of this whole thing and go ahead and change the other code of the other people, right? I mean, make, some, make a whole bunch of different kind of algorithms and test them all against each other. But the, the thing you pull request to me can only be changed on your code. Does that make sense? People online, does that make sense? Yeah. So like Jake, you, you, you know how to do the branches. So you're going to make a branch. Yeah, yeah, I made another branch here. Right, so. and, and, you can, and you can change anything you want on that one. Right. Okay? But, when, if you, but don't, don't merge it back into the other one. Mm -hmm. just, co just copy your code back into the other one. Okay, when, when you're done and when you're ready to pull request it. So yeah, yeah. That's, that's what you're supposed to do in this project. You're supposed to make a branch and then you can change the other algorithms and run all those algorithms together until you find one that's you know just perfect, that works really well. And then when you're done with that, you're gonna go ahead and copy that and you're gonna paste that into the actual file that you're gonna pull request to me. I'm gonna pull request them tonight you know, or tomorrow morning Okay, so everybody has to have their algorithm done. And uh, tomorrow in class, we'll, we'll run it. I might give you a little more time in class tomorrow, but eventually I'll run it. Everyone needs to have pull requested it and have something. And you'll get a checkoff point for that, uh, that you did that one, okay? Any, any other questions? So in that L spot of your program, you're trying to do something, okay? And I mean, you can even do a, you can do it randomly. You can just say, you know, generate, you know, num equals random dot rand, you know, random dot random. And then like from one to two or something. And if it's two, uh, betray. If it's one, collude. You know, you can do something random like that too. That's not, you know, it'd be random. You, you might randomly win every once in a while, who knows, so. Okay, or you could check, you know, you can iterate through the entire opponent history and see how many times they betray me. You know, they betrayed me 50% of the time, so I'm gonna start doing this or whatever, I don't know. You can make it fairly it, simple. You can make it complicated. Does the history reset with each matchup or? Right, so like, so you're, it's gonna iteratively run you against like Jake, okay? And so it's gonna do a, it's gonna start a string opponent history, your, your, Jake's history and your history. Okay, and it's gonna, it's gonna start, start strings every time. So every time you're checking the opponent history, um, you know, it'll be one, there'll be one more character in it. Does that make sense? So then it gets done with that and it records a score somewhere and then it's gonna run you against somebody else and your opponent history and your history are now uh, reset and it's gonna do that again. Does that make sense? Any other questions? It's kind of a complicated thing. I think you can, uh, you know, you look through the, you know, someday, you know, take some time and kind of look through all the functions and try to figure out what everything's going on. I think you can probably figure it out. And then maybe someone can Kind of rewrite the program to make it look really nice with colors and printing out a nice table. And if you want to, you can go in there and find out how do you actually write to a text document? That's something you can do with Python. You can write things and have it export out a text document of stuff. So that's kind of cool. See right here in this section here if you use data file and you have to do an import OS path. So you get a directory where it's gonna put, he needs to know where it's gonna put the file. See, that's all that stuff. File name, tournament.txt, see? You can change that and you'd be able, to, don't change that because it's not gonna pull request for me. But eventually you'll have your own game. You have your own game here, copy your own game. You can, you know, do some different things with it. Use it in the future, maybe in college, you know, you can use it and with some uh, people. 
Okay. Any other questions? Are they good? You can research this too. I mean, computer science people know about prisoners dilemma, so I'm sure you can research probably some good strategies and stuff if you want, but you know, you might want to try to come up on something on your own. Yeah, that's what we're doing. No, all, all you're doing today is you're going to go down to wherever your team was, right? And you're going to, um, like if I was right here, this section right here, okay, is where I can write my algorithm, okay? Here's an example algorithm right there. It's in the else section. Don't change any of the other stuff, okay? And uh, normally you probably, I mean, most of you probably want to keep the first two lines because this first two lines just says, you know, are we on the first round? It just checks the opponent history. You could also check your history either way. If it equals zero, that means there's no, there's no characters in the string yet. That's what it means. So it's the first round. So on the first round, you know, you only have two options. You're returning C or you're returning B. So that's, that part's pretty easy. But you have to decide which one you want to return, okay? So on the first round, if you want to return C, then just put C. If you want to return, if you want to betray on the first round every time, then just change that to a B. Okay, and then, you know, the rest of this stuff, you can, you can do some more stuff, more testing. And whenever you write some code there, you just run it, run the file and see how you're doing against at least Backstabber, you know, Loyal, and those are the only three teams in there right now. But when we run it tomorrow, we'll run it against everybody. Yep. I think I'm gonna stop recording that.